There we go. All right, starting to see some people come in. That's great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or uh, or morning if you're on the West Coast or elsewhere in the world. Um, we're just going to give it a few seconds here for everybody to join the webinar, and then we'll start our conversation with Dan Pink. So, yeah, let's give it just a few more seconds here. My colleague Eric, as I'm sure many of you know the drill by now, my colleague Eric is also setting up our live stream on Facebook. Um, so he is getting that up and great. Yeah, I think we're just about good to get started. So yeah, so let's let's do this thing. So good afternoon, everybody. This is Jeremy with the Next Big Idea Club. And I am here uh, with a Next Big Idea Club curator. It is Mr. Daniel Pink himself, the author of The Power of Regret, How Looking Backward Moves Us Forward. So Dan, welcome to the Next Big Idea Club live stream. Oh, I'm so glad to be here, Jeremy. It's good to be with you and all and the folks who have taken uh, some time from their day, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening to talk about our most misunderstood emotion. That's right. Yes, I know. I, I've been really looking forward to this. I um, loved your book. And it seems like uh, our members really did too. Um, I mean, you know, when we put out a call for uh, questions and comments about the power of regret, um, it was, I mean, really stunning how many people wrote in. I mean, just dozens and dozens of members uh, just could not wait to talk to you about this stuff. Um, so, you know, just, just as one example, we had uh, one member uh, named Dung who says, after reading the book, I feel more open to share my regrets with others and learn the lessons in a more compassionate way. Uh, so, so Dan, it looks like uh, you nailed it. You nailed it this time, you know, just like well, every other it, time. <laughs> let me, well, no, let, let, let me, let me, let me expand on that a little bit because that reaction is the, is the reaction that actually inspired me to write this book. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and um, I, for, for the next big idea club members, they might, they might find it interesting is that let's go back in time to, to 2019, really around this, this summer, the summer of 2019, a hmm. uh, very different world. Um, and um, to make a, a long story as short as I'm able, uh, I was at my, uh, one of my kids graduated from college. That's sort of, you know, for, for people my age, that's sort of a marker. It's kind of, it's, it's weird. Um, and I started thinking about my own regrets. Uh, I started thinking about my regrets. I was like, oh my God, it's like, I wish I had taken more risk in college. I wish I had been kinder. Um, and what happened was, is that I very sheepishly started talking to some people about my own regrets. And what I found in contrast to what I expected was that people wanted to talk about this. They wanted mm -hmm. to share their regrets. They wanted to engage on this. And so as it happened, again, three, three summers, ago, in the summer of 2019, I was actually working on an entirely different book. I had a contract for a totally different book. And the reaction that I got to this so intrigued me that I took a month to do some research just to sort of get the basics of what science knew about regret and what had already been written about it. And I just couldn't get the idea out of my head. And I ended up writing an entirely new book proposal, wow. uh, which my editor knew nothing about. <laughs> and, and then I finally went to him and said, hey, guess what? This book you think I've been working on for the last few months, I haven't done anything. <laughs> but what I have been doing is this. Uh, and so, right. and, and so the, the point of all that is that this is a topic that I think people respond to very uh, uh, um, viscerally, very uh, authentically uh, with both their hearts and their, and their brains. And that's why, that's why I found it so compelling. Yes, absolutely. And, and so what was your editor's response when you finally presented him with this new unexpected work? He was skeptical. <laughs> oh, um, really? Was he really? Well, he was skeptical because he was like, what the hell have you been doing? <laughs> you know, it's like you, you like you, we have this document that says or we have this agreement that's or it's a, it is a document. We have this document that says you're going to write a book about X. And now you're telling me you want to write a book about Y. But he's a very nice guy. And he's like, OK, let me let me think about this. And so he um, uh, and he actually had those early stages on that initial book proposal, uh, which, which I like to do. I like to write fairly longish book proposals, maybe 25 mm -hmm. pages. This one was maybe 25 pages. He had some. Mm -hmm. He says, well, I don't understand this. And I don't understand what you're talking about here. And let's strengthen mm -hmm. this before we go out to the wider world to try mm -hmm. to get you out of con this one contract and into a new contract. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. Are, are you at liberty to disclose what this previous book you were working on is or not just yet? Um, it was a, yeah, I mean, I, don't, I mean, uh, it was a, it was the idea that um, it, it, the way that I was thinking about it, and again, it was evolving, was that um, imagine if, imagine if 
aliens came to the um, came to earth hmm. and they needed a field manual to understand who these creatures called human beings were oh cool okay and that's what it was because they're basically saying okay i can sum up who humans are and what makes them tick in i had you know like 10 principles they're like aliens there are only 10 things you need to know about these creatures and they huh. are these 10 things Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting that uh, that your editor was more skeptical of the regret book because it seems so much more down to earth, both figuratively and literally. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 yeah. It was it was the uh, um, the well, well, I mean that, that's that's sort of the, the the high level construct. It wasn't necessarily a guide for aliens, but it would be it would be sure. it'd be similar to that. But more, but actually, the more I pushed on it, the more I actually liked that conceit of making it a guide for aliens. Yeah, I mean, like like imagine if aliens imagine if aliens came to came to earth and somehow they had, they had gotten a user manual to these human beings. Like I would totally want to see what that, what that said, you know? Yes, no, I would too. And, yeah. and if you end up re uh, writing that book, um, I would absolutely read it. Um, but, uh, but since uh, you ended up writing the power of regret, I think we should talk a little bit about your book. Let's do then. that. Yeah. All right. So, you know, so like I mentioned, we have just so many, members writing in with questions and I want to be sure that we get to um, a good yeah, handful sure of them. Um, and so, for example, uh, just to, to keep talking about uh, the, the genesis of this book, uh, we had one, one member, Pamela, uh, who asks, from where or what sources do you draw on most heavily when you are researching and writing? Okay, well, in this book, that's a good, that's, that's a really important question. And it's, and I think it helps understand, you know, I think what makes this book different and what, and what, what I'm aspiring to do to make this book a, a contribution to people's understanding. So for this book, there, there are essentially three legs in this stool. One is that I looked at about 50 years of research, existing research in this emotion of regret. You know, this, this terrible feeling that we have when we look back and say, oh, if only I had done that, if only I hadn't done that, and we feel bad about it. Mm. Um, it uh, there's, uh, there's, again, about a half century of research in a number of different fields, uh, uh, social psychology, there's a lot in there, developmental psychology, there's a lot in there, cognitive science, neuroscience. So what does this existing research tell us about this? But mm. I also wanted to do some research on my own to fill in some, I, what I thought were some gaps in understanding. So I did a second piece of research on my own called the American Regret Project, which was the largest public opinion survey ever conducted about American attitudes on regret. We went out and fashioned a sample of 4,489 Americans, asked them a whole bunch of questions about regret, um, trying to find, in, in large part, what demographic differences there were in people's experiences of regret. Mm. Um, turned out there weren't that many, but <laughs> that's, what the, that's what we led. And then finally, yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I did something called the World Regret Survey, which was a massive collection tool where we um, have collected regrets now from over 21,000 people in 109 countries. And that proved extremely revelatory. So that's how I did that. And then from the World Regret Survey, um, I gave people who submitted a regret the option to include their email address for a follow-up interview. And, um, and I ended up interviewing, I, I want to say face-to-face, -face, but it's all on Zoom, but I guess it is face-to-face, -face, just yeah, time, right. <laughs> you know, in the same room. Yeah. Um, um, I ended up interviewing about, I, I can't remember the exact number, but you know, somewhere around like 150, 160 of them. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, it's so interesting that you did so much of your own original research for this book. I think that is something that really makes it stand out. And um, and yeah, I mean, I, I loved reading all these stories that you that you reported from these people that you interviewed. Um, and you know, I think this leads in nicely to another question from a member. Um, Yara asks, uh, "What has Dan learned from readers about regret since the book was published?" Do you feel like your your understanding of the topic has changed at all since since it actually hit bookstore shelves? Um, that's a really interesting. That's a super interesting question, it, and it's one that I it's one that I it's one that I that I think about a lot. I I, I think the one thing that I've learned is that people are um, really in need of a systematic way to remake their regrets that mm. that at some level I, I i at some level uh people are really adrift about what to do with this that that is this is that it, that's been that this philosophy of no regrets this idea that we should always be positive never be negative always look forward never look back has been so dominant that when you when you um talk to people about regret like it takes 
less effort than I thought to convince them that no regrets was a stupid philosophy. And what <laughs> they, and, you know what I mean? And what they really yeah. want to do is like, what do I do about it? So at some level, I've, I've wondered whether the, the way that the book is organized is that I thought it's, it's organized in three parts. One is what is regret reclaimed, where I'm trying to sort of change our understanding of regret. The mm. other is regret revealed, where I talk about some new insights and what people regret. And the third part is regret remade, which, which, which addresses that issue of what to do with them. Part of me thought that maybe I should have led with regret remade. That I should have <laughs> led with the led with the the takeaways. That led with the way that people can um, led with the way that people can use it, or actually maybe perhaps offered readers their own path through the book rather mm. than my path through the book. So it's saying if you're this kind of person, read the book in this order. If you're this kind of person, read the book in that order. And if you're this mm. kind of person, read the book in that order. That might have been an interesting thing. So that's. It's, it's a weird, it's, it's a great question, is that, but that is the thing that comes first to mind. Gotcha. No, I think that's a great answer. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think um, I myself was, was fully on board right away with like, yeah, regrets exist and we kind of need to let them in. We need to embrace them, you know? So I was, um, I was really excited by the beginning of the book where um, you kind of, uh, you, you argue against this no regrets philosophy. You know, I think that was a great way to start it. And, uh, and I was certainly on board. So, um, okay. yeah. And, you know, before we start getting to, um, you know, the, the specifics of, you know, what you say in your book about how to deal with, with regret, um, or maybe this will be relevant. Um, we have a, a live question, uh, from, yeah. uh, Jason Spector. Uh, thank you for writing in Jason. Uh, he says, I would ask Dan what he thinks that we can pass on to our kids and younger peers at work from learning about regret that they could do differently? What do you think, Dan? Great question. Um, I think that one of the most transformative things that you can do, and, and what's interesting about this, Jeremy uh, and Jason, is that I, I've started to get emails of groups doing this, hmm. uh, is I think one of the most things that we can do for, if you're a parent or a boss, is you know, you're, you're having dinner with your family or you are, you know, having a meeting with your team, whatever. Tell people about a regret that you have. Mm. Tell them what you learned from it. Tell them what you're going to do about it. And I, and, mm. and I think that all three of those are essential. Um, mm. It's all three of, the, all three of those are essential. Um, so, so disclose your regret, okay? And what that does is that humanizes you as a parent or a boss, but it also helps create psychological safety for people to share their regret. Mm -hmm. uh, but don't leave it there. Draw a lesson from it, okay? It's very important to make sense of our regrets yes. and then tell people what you're going to do about it. And I think what I've heard from people who have emailed it in is that that, that can be a, a transformative conversation. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to do that. And it's a very simple thing. It's a very, very simple thing to do. Right. Well, well, in the interest of, of doing that, um, I have to ask Dan, what's a, what's a big regret that, that you feel like you have? Um, oh, and, I, I, and yeah. Well, I mean, part of this, you know, there's an old adage in, uh, in uh, social and social science that all research is me search. Yes. And, and I think that was true for me in, 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 in some ways, because I was making sense of my, I was making sense of my own regrets. And mm. I was also at a point in my life where I finally, where I had room to look back for the, for, I think for the first time ever. That mm. is, you know, I'm in my 50s. I know I look like I'm a teenager, but I, I know I'm in my 50s. And, um, and, I, and I just, I, I, I would not have written this book in my 20s or 30s. I didn't have enough mileage on me. Mm. Uh, I didn't have enough room to look back. But now that I had room to look back, like most people who have room to look back, I look back and I say, oh, I wish I had done this. I wish I had not done that. I, I'll tell you one that I have. Um, sure. One big, I have a lot of them, but I'll tell you one big regret that I have. Uh, and it has to do with kindness. Um, now, um, a lot of the regrets, so a lot of people's moral regrets tend to be regrets about action. I hurt some, I, you know, I cheated on my spouse, I bullied somebody, I stole, right? My regret about kindness, which is, I think, a moral regret, was, is, is, is about inaction. Um, mm -hmm. And, I, and I'll, let me explain what I mean. When I was younger, and I'm thinking about when I was in secondary school, when I was in college, when I was a young professional, I was never a bully, truly. Uh, mm. I, I don't think I, I, I really wasn't. That's that something a bully would say, Dan. <laughs> just, just messing with you, just messing with you. Uh, yeah, no, no, I think that, I mean, we can go back and, and, and interview people in my misspent youth. I, I don't <laughs> think that being a bully would be the first thing. They would say that I was a jerk, that I was a loser, but they, I don't know if they'd say that I was a bully. Um, but, um, but there were many instances, Jeremy, where I was in situations where people were not being treated right. They were... Mm being excluded they were not being treated fairly 
And here's the thing. It's not like I didn't see it. I mm-hmm. saw it. It's not mm-hmm. like, oh, I didn't know it was wrong. I knew it was wrong, but I didn't right. say anything or do anything. And that has mm-hmm. bugged me for a very, very, very long time. Mm-hmm. Now, here's what I think is actually some of the things that the, the, the way that this can be an, an example of how we can use regret. So mm-hmm. to me, if we look at the science and we've looked at our own experience, what regret does most powerfully are two things. First, it clarifies what we value. Second, it instructs us on what to do better. Mm-hmm. So what this regret did now, I, so, so, so again, so, so what I could have done is I could have actually uh, gotten captured by the fog machine of no regret and said, no, 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 I don't hear it. I don't, I don't, I don't look backward. I don't look yes. backward. It's all positive. Yes. I don't want to. Okay. That's a bad mm-hmm. idea. Hmm. What I could, what's also a bad idea is to say, oh my God, I can't believe I was so inert in the face of people in mistreatment. I'm just an awful human being. I don't deserve to be a part of civilized society. I'm just a wretched, irredeemable person. That's mm-hmm. a bad idea too. Mm-hmm. What I, what, what, what's happening here, first of all, is that it's a signal about what I value. Mm-hmm. The fact that it stuck with me for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, that is telling. That is a signal we cannot ignore. There have been so many decisions. There's so many decisions I made yesterday that I don't even remember. There are decisions I made last last month that I don't remember. So I make all these, you make all these decisions and indecisions in mm-hmm. your life. And most of them you don't remember. But the ones that stick with you for decades and bug you, that's telling you something, right? Yes, it's yes. clarifying. And so, so to me, it's clarifying in a way that other things did not, that I actually value kindness more than I would have expected. Hmm. That is. If you were to ask me before I started reckoning with this regret, do you value kindness? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but it wasn't really from, it wasn't as much from the heart, but this is a reminder. It's like, wow, actually you value kindness. You, you, you value kindness in others. You value kindness in yourself. Second, it's instructing me about what to do. I don't want to have that feeling again. Mm-hmm. And so now, again, I don't want to oversell my virtue here, but, but now if you see me in situations, even like sort of simple mundane situations, and my wife can attest to this. If you, if you see that if I'm in like a social situation and like there are like four people talking together and there's one person, as you often see in social situations, who's kind of like marooned by him or herself, I will open up the circle, reach in and pull that person in. And that's because of the experience of feeling so, so shitty about being unkind in the, forgive that word, for being so unkind in the, in the, um, uh, in, in the past. And so, so that to me is that to me is 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 uh, is how we use our regrets. We use them to help clarify what we value and instruct us on how to do better. We don't wallow in them. We don't ignore them. We look them in the eye. Yes. No. I I, I love that, and and I can really relate to that too. I mean, I remember in in high school in particular, um, watching you know a couple of of kids get sort of ostracized, you know, and and watch people laugh at them, you know, to their face and behind their back. And, and I didn't say enough, you know, I remember just kind of like awkwardly chuckling along, hoping that I wouldn't be the next target. Right. Right. Um, right. Because, you know, especially when you're 15 and your sense of self is just kind of blooming, you know, that threat of, of social ostracization feels like the threat of death, you know? And so you just want to do anything you can to not be that next target. And, but of course, looking back, you realize that, you know, that's probably not the best, that's probably not the best response. Um, so no, I, I totally understand where, where you're coming from there, Dan. Um, and I think, you know, you started talking there a little bit about um, what, to, what to do with your regrets, you know, and how to turn them into this, uh, this productive, uh, generative force um, in your life. And, um, and so, I, and I think that that leads in really nicely uh, to another question from a, from a member. Um, from, uh, from Susan, who's asking about uh, unhelpful rumination. And she says, how, oh, yeah. do we, how, how do we not focus on regret, even though we know we shouldn't? I'm okay. oh, sorry, did you want to add something? No, 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 that's a great, that's a really, really, really important question. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and the thing is, we have evidence and, and mechanisms and practices to avoid that. And I just want to, again, say, that what we want to do is we want to find the middle way. We don't want to ignore our regrets, but we don't want to ruminate on our regrets and wallow in our regrets. So 
the way I look at this is there's a there's a there is um, the uh, a three part process, but the first part is the most important for what Susan is talking about, um, and, and and it is this: when we think about what rumination is, um, you let's okay, let, let's say that I um, I regret um, um, I, I I don't I, 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 I just pick a let's 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 just let's just pick a regret. Let's say I regret um, um, uh, losing. Let's, let's just keep the bullying. Let's, let's keep the, the unkindness. Regret. Okay. I regret being, I regret being unkind. All right. Hmm. So ruminating is, is thinking about that all the time. But when we think about it, we talk to ourselves. This is the point. Hmm. And when we talk to ourselves in the face of missteps and mistakes and screw ups, we are brutal. Our self-talk is cruel. If you, you know, I want you to, the folks listening here, I want you to think about this. Think about the way you talk to yourself in the face of mistakes and screw ups. Think about the language you use. I think about the language that I use. It's ridiculous in a way. I would never talk to anybody else that way. If you were to broadcast my self-talk out there in the world, if I were to use the self-talk in the face of mistakes on other people in a workplace, I would be fired. Okay. You, you really would be a bully, Dan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, or I'd be, yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be, I would be like, I would be, yeah, I would, it would be a form of bullying, right? It would be this kind of aggressive, um, uh, lacerating kind of language. All right. And so here's the, here's the, here's the, the, the point here. Don't do that. We have this whole line of research in what's called self-compassion started 20 years ago by Kristen Neff at U the university of Texas. What it tells us is this, and this is, and, and forgive me for sort of coming at this in, in a little bit of a roundabout way, Susan, but here's what you do. All right. Number one is that you should treat yourself in the face of these screw ups and mistakes, treat yourself with kindness rather than contempt. We have a, a profoundly difficult time doing this. W what the science tells us is not to treat yourself better than anybody else. It's not to boost your self-esteem, but we, our instinct is that with ourselves, we should begin with lacerating self-criticism. And there's, in, there's no evidence that's effective. What's effective instead is, is treating yourself with compassion. Treat yourself with kindness rather than contempt. Second, recognize that your mistakes and screw-ups are part of the human experience. Too often, we think that what we have done is somehow singular, that we're incredibly unique in the world, and we're not, all right? Anybody, like, you know, if we got all the folks listening in today to share one of their regrets, I'm telling you, in 90 seconds, I could probably find an identical regret in my database of 21,000 regrets somewhere mm -hmm. on the world, right? So recognize that your regrets are part of the human experience. The other thing here, Susan, is recognize that your mistake, your screw up, your, your blunder, whatever it is, is a moment in your life, not the full measure of our life. Why should a single moment, good or bad, fully capture who you are as a person? Why do you want, don't make that sort of universal attribution about who you are based on a single incident? And when we do these things, treat yourself with kindness rather than contempt recognize that your mistakes are part of the human condition and then recognize that it's a moment not the full measure of your life what that does is that arrests the march toward rumination the a reason that people ruminate is that they don't know what the alternative is they don't have a way they don't have like a circuit breaker to stop that and even more than being a circuit breaker to stop that what this does this process of self-compassion does is that it opens the way to make sense of the regret and draw lessons from it. So again, the way to stop the march toward rumination are these simple self-compassion practices. And again, let me just, again, treat yourself with kindness rather than contempt, recognize that, that your mistake is part of the human condition, recognize that it's the moment in your life, not the full measure of your life. And with a little bit of practice, that response to mistakes and screw ups and setbacks and regrets can prevent us from sliding down that slope into rumination. Right. No, I, I think that's beautifully said. Yeah. I mean, I think self-compassion is not only does it, uh, it, it make your regrets less painful, but I think it just makes all of life a lot less painful. <laughs> you know, I think it I makes agree. Just, yeah, I agree. The, the, there's uh, I encourage you to. Um, I mean, I guess folks have the book, you know, open up the, the, the chapter, go to the index and there's a, there's a couple pages, I think maybe two pages where I try to summarize the 20 years of research and self-compassion and it is mm. powerful. Yeah. I mean, it it is it is powerful it is uh it is uh, it is it is woefully under recognized as a force mm. 
exactly as you say, Jeremy, not only for dealing with regret, sure, but for improving performance on a whole range of tasks for, um, there's some really powerful uh, physiological benefits. It's, um, and, and the thing is that no one ever teaches us how to do this. Yes. This is the big problem here. This is the gap that I'm seeing in this, in this research on regret that we've been sold such a bill of goods that we should be positive all the time, that we should banish negative thoughts. Norman Vincent Peale's, you know, said that we should not even, we should, we should uh, strip the word regret from our vocabulary. This wow. idea that we need to be, that it's all about positivity. It's all about looking forward. It's all about looking on the bright side. We should never look back. We should never be negative. That is not a recipe for living. And I think a reason people are willing to buy that false promise, sort of, sort of, you know, pray at the altar of that false prophet is that we don't have the alternative. We don't know what to do instead. And what we can do instead are some systematic things. Now, just to be clear here, forgive me my, my rant here, is that we should have a lot of positive emotions. It's not like positivity is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. We should have a lot of positive emotions. Optimism, there are a lot of benefits to optimism. Positive emotions are great. They make us feel better. They make us do better. I want to have a lot of positive emotions. I want all the people in this webinar to have a lot of positive emotions. But the idea that we should have only positive emotions is foolhardy. We Negative emotions serve a purpose. And when we look at the negative emotions in the human experience, the most common is regret. And I think the most transformative is regret. And if we learn how to confront it systematically, we can use it for a whole array of, of uh, benefits. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and I think we have a, a member here, uh, Lisa, who, who has an interesting thing to add. She says- And Omar about... wants me to stop banging on the desk. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm doing this. <laughs> You're just very passionate, Dan. You're just very passionate about- Yeah, I'm gonna- about... <laughs> Sure thing, Omar, I'm gonna sit on my hands just for Omar, here we go. Let's see if I can, let's see if I can answer a question without my hands. Okay. Although actually, Dan, in a previous uh, Next Big Idea Club selection, the extended mind, we learned that uh, talking with our hands actually helps us think better. So you Absolutely. may not want to well, sit I, I, on them for too long. I, um, well, I mean, let me, let me see what, let me, let me see what I can do. Right. No, <laughs> okay. that, so let's. We'll see how it goes. But yes, but Lisa Westbrook says, uh, talking about self-compassion reminds me of the, of how identifying feelings based on needs and being intentional about self-compassion helps you become aware of the feelings and needs of others, which I think is really great point. Yeah. That is, like, that's, I think that's, I think that's a very, uh, that's a point that I did not make well in the book, Lisa. And, and I think you're exactly right. I'm sort of, um, um, I have my feet tangled up too, but if my feet weren't tangled up, I would kick myself. <laughs> um, because, because, um, uh, I think that's, I think that's a really, I think it's a really good point. And, and, and I think there, there is a, there's sort of a philosophical argument that, that it's, that makes some sense to me that it's actually difficult to have compassion for others. If you don't, if you don't begin with compassion for yourself. So it's a really mm. smart point, Lisa. Thank you for that. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Very, very nicely said. Uh, we have another question from a live viewer, uh, Brian Matamore, uh, who asks, do the kindest slash nicest people have the most regrets? Do egotists have the fewest regrets when frankly, they should have the most? What do you think? Very interesting question. And, 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 and my answer is, I don't know. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what I do know. Um, is that um, regret is the, the people without, re there are people without regrets, okay? There are people without regrets. For instance, five-year-olds don't have regrets uh, right. because their brain, I mean it, uh, there's, uh, you know, I, I looked at, I spent a month reading the developmental psychology on this and, and wow. it's pretty clear that, <laughs> that um, it's pretty clear that, that regret is, an, is a, pretty important stage in our the ability to process regret and think counterfactually is a pretty important stage in our brain development literally our mm. brain our the development of our brain not just our mind but our the brain itself so five-year-olds don't have the next regret is really complicated what do you have to do you have to i'm serious like, to experience regret you have to like go back in time in your head and then you know remember what you did and how you felt and then in some in many cases negate that what you did See, if only I had done X rather than Y, and then you get, get back in your little mental time machine, you come back to the present, but the present you're visiting is completely reconfigured because of what you did. It's very complicated. So five-year-olds, six-year-olds, usually around seven or eight, people begin to 
be able to process regrets. So, so five-year-olds don't have regrets. Uh, there are certain kinds of brain lesions, brain damage, neurodegenerative diseases that interfere with the processing of regret. And to, your, to sort of more directly to your point, sociopaths don't have regret. Okay, so that so the so so when you think about extreme unkindness, when you think about an extreme deficit of kindness, uh, you see that. Um, beyond that, I don't know about the correlation. I looked at some other things in my quantitative survey to try to find that out. Um, um, I, I I asked people to in the again the American Regret Project, okay, where I can I think I can make so 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 I was trying to probe that, and I looked at. Uh, it's kind of sort of adjacent, right? I looked at like introversion, and extroversion. So think about this. Who has, who has more regrets, introverts or extroverts? I had people, I had people self-identify. So I said, are you introvert, extrovert, or, or, you know, a little bit of both. Mm. And what I found is that there was absolutely zero correlation between introversion, extroversion, <laughs> and propensity to regret or the kind of regrets that people had. It made no <laughs> difference at all. Um, and so um, I'd be interesting to if there was a, a good measure of kindness. Um, so maybe some kind of measure of empathy or even something sort of close to agreeableness. That'd be super interesting. But my guess is that um, my guess, I don't know. I don't even know what I would predict. I'm, I, I'm not I'm not because I because I think I can make an argument that unkind people might have um, could conceivably have more regrets. That is, they have a they have a darker they have a darker view of, of the world. Um, mm -hmm. They have a less charitable Maybe view of themselves, of and, right? Yeah, they have a less charitable view view. Of, it's back to Lisa's point in a way. It's sort of the the other end of the telescope and Lisa's point, where it's like they have a less charitable view of others, which means they might have a less charitable view of themselves. So who knows? It's a yeah. fascinating question. I wish I wish I knew. Yeah, no, it is a great question, though. I totally agree. Um, and uh, we have uh, another live question. This is great, guys. Keep, keep the questions coming. Yeah. Uh, from Diana Gaylor. And this actually, it, it resembles another question that I, ha I had written in my notes that I wanted to get to uh, from, yeah. uh, from, a from a member named Tim. So this is perfect. Thank you, Diana. Uh, she asks, what is the connection between regret and shame? Um, and do narcissists experience regret? Okay, so so let me take the second one. I, I, a narcissist... Um... My hunch, I, I didn't, I didn't measure this, and I haven't seen any um, of the. Um, of my, my hunch would be narcissists would be less likely to experience regret. Mm. That's just a hunch. I, I don't remember seeing any research on that question, um, um, that that question in particular. But that'd be my hunch on that, only because, you know, regret requires agency. So narcissists feel like they have plenty of agency, but they also feel like they're always doing the. They're always doing the the right thing. So, and they mm. probably could be more disappointed in other people. So I don't know. Uh, but I, there there are there are you know if I were to, I I, I sometimes you know will. Well, I, I wonder I, if I wonder yeah. if I could just cut in just for a second, yeah. Dan. I wonder if the narcissist's regrets would. I wonder if you know maybe they would have them, but they would be more focused on like disappointing the self or like saying, oh, I, I things could have been better for me had yeah. I done X thing, you know, without, you know, worrying so much about things could have been better for X person had I helped them or whatever. Like, I don't think they would necessarily yeah. have the yeah. regret that you feel about, about high school, but, you know, maybe they regret something that they did that uh, disadvantaged themselves in some way. I don't know. That's just my hunch though. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So, so, so again, so I think that, I think that m my hunch would be, and, and, and I just made a note to like, look this up, uh, because it's, it's a great question. My hunch would be that they would feel a sense of agency over their actions, but I, I think they would, I think they would attribute anything gone awry to somebody else that mm. it would never be, it would never be their fault that they would, they would, they, they would, they would, they would feel, forgive the, the 50 cent psychology word. They would feel agent, agentic, ah. in successful outcomes, but come up with alternative explanations for less good outcomes that they yes. would attribute it to the external. That, that'd be my guess. Now there's mm -hmm. another, uh, there's a second part to that question too. Yeah, what uh, is oh, the regret connection and shame. between- Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, so regret and shame. So this is a, a really super interesting question and, and it's actually related to the narcissist question in, in another way. So let's, 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 let's come up with a, let's, let's take a step back and look at our, some, of, some of these emotions in sort of a broader constellation. Okay, so, so let's talk about regret. Let's talk about shame. But let me throw in guilt and let me throw in disappointment because I think mm. that the differences among these, these emotions help us see, clarify this to, um, um, 
Diana's question. Hmm. So let's talk about the difference between regret and disappointment, because hmm. it goes to the narcissist question in some ways. It's that that difference is is almost entirely agency. Yeah. All right. Regret is your fault. Disappointment hmm. is something else. So, I mean, the classic example is, um, um, OK, let's say that let's say that I want to. So they just because everybody wants to know a lot about the the granular details of my life. It just so happened that here in the District of Columbia, uh, just two blocks from my house, they opened up the district government, uh, the DCPR, the Parks and Recreation, opened up a very nice public pool, um, like literally two blocks from my house. And it has, you know, and, and, I, and I, like to, I like to swim laps. I'm like, wow, this is awesome, okay? So, I, so, so there's certain days where I say, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go swim laps um, at, at this pool. But if it's raining, I can't swim laps. Now I can't. Now if it rains, I can't say, "Oh, I regret that it's raining," because I don't have any control over that. I can be disappointed <laughs> that it rains, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if I want to walk to the grocery store and I know it's going to rain and I don't bring an umbrella, I can't mm -hmm. regret that it's raining. But I can regret that I didn't bring an umbrella because it's my fault. Right. All right. So that's forgive that tortured explanation, but that's the difference between regret and disappointment. A mm -hmm. better one for the handful of you who are sports fans out there is that is that. You know, I'm a fan of, of of Washington sports teams, which at this moment in time is not a great thing. Mm -hmm. And so, so the Washington Nationals. So I'm a, I'm a baseball fan. Washington Nationals have the worst record in Major League Baseball. Jeez. I don't like that, <laughs> but I can't regret. Like I can't regret that. Like that's a negative right. emotion, mm -hmm. but I can't regret it. I don't play. I don't coach. I don't own the team. Mm -hmm. So I'm disappointed in that. So that's the difference between regret and disappointment. And I think going back to the narcissist question. That the that the that 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 narcissist might be over indexed on disappointment in others. That mm. the that 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 at any that that he or she would be probably he would be as I said before agentic in good outcomes, but unagentic in bad outcomes. Now let's go back actually to the question that she asked. Let's talk about guilt and shame because it, in our constellation, guilt is close to shame, but there's a very important difference there. To me, guilt is a type of regret. Guilt is the regret about a moral transgression. If only I had not cheated on my spouse. If only I had told the truth, whatever. And I feel I didn't do that. I feel guilty. I'm at this juncture. I can do the right thing. I can do the wrong thing. I feel the wrong thing. I regret it. And that, that feeling of regret is a feeling of guilt. Mm. Okay. Shame, is, shame is, is different. Shame is what we were talking about before. Shame is really a universal, is, is an attribution about the person. Guilt is an attribution about the act. Mm. Shame is an attribution about the person. And that's why shame is so destructive. Shame is a very destructive emotion. Guilt is, I did a bad thing. Shame is, I'm a bad person. Um, and, and that's why it's so, that's why the fact that you've done a bad thing does not in and of itself make you a bad person it mm -hmm. really you know and so uh, and that's why shame is so destructive so so when we think about these emotions it's a it's about it's about agency all right how much agency we feel for these things and it's also about how much we want to and in a sort of a healthy rule of thumb is that and it's true there's some interesting relationship research here too is that when you um when you that you want to make at some level, universal attributions for positive things and sort of situational momentary attributions for negative things. And this is true. So, mm -hmm. so, um, so, in, so if your spouse forgets your birthday, you don't say to him, oh, he always does things like that. You just say, oh, wow, this particular time he forgot the birth, his, my birthday because right. he was really stressed out at work. All right. And mm -hmm. then, but if you get a birthday gift, you say, oh my God, I have the kindest, loveliest spouse there ever was. So, mm, so again, so, so a lot of it is sort of how we attribute behavior, mm -hmm. um, whether we make it universal or momentary, and also how much agency we feel. So forgive that long-winded answer, but I, I think that, I think understanding the constellation of those emotions is helpful. No, I, I totally agree. And, and, and it seems uh, like, like members do too. Like uh, Gail Ritchie, for example, just wrote in saying, I'm enjoying contrasting these definitions versus the ones that Brene Brown shared in Atlas of the Heart. So if anyone's yeah. looking for, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, she. And that's, that's interesting because when because because her atlas is a far broader set of emotions than 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 this particular one. I'm actually sort of more narrowed in on um, sort of this particular solar system of emotions in the giant galaxy sure. of, of emotions. I, I'm going to pick up Jeremy here on John has a question. Yeah, please, yeah. Shame. Is it a matter of your ability to forgive yourself? 
Uh, yes, and this is what, uh, yes, it's, it's about self-compassion. It, it, it is about, um, it is about, it is about, again, treating yourself with, with kindness rather than contempt. And once again, there's a third way. You don't say, you don't do, I love the question. I think that this question about narcissism actually is, is, is illuminating. You don't do what a narcissist says and say, yeah, I did something. Maybe that was wrong, but who cares? Like I'm an awesome person anyway, right? That's delusional. But you mm -hmm. also don't. You, you also don't berate yourself. You say, "Well, wait a second. Um, um, again, this is a. I, I did a bad thing. I shouldn't have done a bad thing. Here is the lesson I learned, and here's how I'm going to apply that lesson going forward. And what's more, for certain kinds of bad things, especially kinds of regrets of action, you can do other things. You can try to undo that. So I have, for instance, in this database, I have a lot of people who regret bullying more than I ever would have expected, coming back to this idea again. Uh, but I've also heard, again, from, from, from readers and whatnot, uh, 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 an astonishing number of people, more than I would have expected, who have gone back to the people, bullies, who have gone back to the people whom they bullied hmm. and apologized. And hmm. one of the interesting things there was that the bull, the people who were bullied, seem in general not are much less traumatized mm. than the people mm. who did the bullying, huh. and it it could be that it could be related to John's point that the 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 victim, in, not in every case, moved on, maybe even forgave, and when you forgive, you you somehow I and mean, one of the things we see in the forgiveness research is that forgiveness is a way of liberating yourself. Forget about the other person. Forgiveness mm. is good for you. <laughs> Um, yeah. and, and, um, and, and that the, the bully had not forgiven him or herself and the, and the recipient of the mm -hmm. bullying had, and therefore the recipient was untroubled, but the bully was troubled. Yeah, no, that's, that's super interesting. And that does make sense. You know, I think sometimes it's easier to, uh, to forgive someone else and forgive ourselves. And, you know, we, I really, I, sometimes let it be myself up kind of mercilessly um whereas i'm much give someone else's uh you know um so it looks like jeremy froze a little up oh, jeremy's gone so um so I'm hoping that everybody can still hear me. Jeremy will pop back on here. Um, oh, there's Jeremy. There we go. Am I back? Sorry about okay. that, guys. Yeah. Okay. I was, good. Uh, good. Good. That was weird. Yeah. My 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 whole Zoom window crashed completely. But you could you could still hear me through that whole thing. No, I couldn't hear you. But I but I was I was actually looking at the at the chat for questions too. I, we're we're going to try to do it without you, of course. Gotcha. <laughs> well, that's because well, you're, I, I, because you're indispensable to this whole venture. Uh, I appreciate that. Well, uh, well, since I'm back, uh, th there was a question that I wanted to ask you, Dan, following up on actually follows perfectly about this, dis this discussion about narcissists. Um, Jeanette wrote in saying there are those who seem immune to regret, um, even when their actions inflict pain on others. And so yeah. how should we deal with these people? Well, it could be that. It, it, so I think there are a couple of things. Number one, it could be that a person like truly is a sociopath. And and there, mm. there the, the remedy is nothing that you can do. Uh, but mm. I think I think in some cases what you're seeing there is a performance rather than mm. the authentic expression of an emotion. Uh, and, I, and I'll tell you what I'll tell you what makes me think about that. Uh, I, I think that people have been seduced by, by this philosophy of no regrets, so that if they admit having a regret. They think of it as a sign of weakness. They think of it as a sign of a disorder, and so they perform. This this kind of uh, this pantomime of no of of no regrets because they think that it is an act of courage well, when it's mm -hmm. when it's not and I and I, I'll tell you one of the things that gives me a hint that that's go, that goes on a fair bit so I do this world regret survey and I invite people from around the world to contribute one of their big regrets and I get this database and every you know just about every day I would read through the latest entry of regrets and there were so many times people they go to the world regret survey. They and they say, I don't have any regrets. All right. I don't have any regrets. All right. But wait. I don't have any regrets. But, you know, um, 
uh, a few years ago, I cheated on my wife and I feel, I feel really, really bad about that. <laughs> You know, and, and so they would go to like to admit a regret, you know, right. and so yes. I'll give you an, I'll give you another example of this, that it's that it's a little bit performative. And again, this goes to I mean, I think there's an important question anytime, you know, you, you read a book or hear somebody make arguments is really to interrogate how that person knows what they're claiming to know. And so so let me give so I, I, like, I like so this is why I like to show my work here. So let me give you another example of this. This is from the American Regret Project. Remember, the quantitative public opinion survey that I did. I asked people a question, but I asked it in a certain way. I said, how often do you look back on your life and wish you had done things differently? Mm. Okay. Now I'm describing regret, but I'm not using the R word. Right. So we have this representative sample of the U S population. Okay. This is a very good piece of survey research. We found that 1% of people said, Never. I never looked back in my life and wish I had done things differently. We had, I think it was 15, 16% said rarely. Hmm. But 83, 84% said they do it at least occasionally. And so hmm. this is why there's some, the word itself is so freighted that people like to perform not having regrets. But if you just peel back the layer one little bit, um, you'll find that they, they, they do have regrets and they just don't know what to do with them, except for the sociopaths. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, some people truly don't, but yeah, I think you're right that the average person, very few, but, but very few, very few people truly have no regret. I mean, tr very few people truly have no regrets. And, and, and it's probably, I think most of them are either um, are, are sociopaths. There might be a, a portion of narcissists in there, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and it could be people who, who literally have some other kind of cognitive disorder. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's another thing I wanted to ask you about, Dan, and uh, this is uh, somewhat selfish of me because this is the, one of the parts of the book that, I, that resonated with me the most. Uh, but I really liked uh, uh, the few pages where you were talking about uh, the three selves, you know, how you have your, your actual self and your ideal self and your ought self. And, um, and this really resonated with me because I tend to um, act a lot based on the discrepancy between my actual self and my ought self. Um, so much so that my, uh, my, my parents have joked that, uh, that I should really stop uh, shooting all over myself. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> line. I, 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 yeah, it's a good line. Yeah, I'm going to credit my dad for that one. Um, but it's true. You know, I often act based not on what I truly want to do, but what I feel like I should do. Um, and so I guess I just wanted to ask you more about that, that distinction between the actual ideal and ought self and how someone like me who can't seem to stop shooting all over himself, um, how can I maybe move past that? I think it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think it depends on where that should comes from because they're different, mm. I think they're different sources of that ought. So, you know, one source of the ought could be, uh, I hold a set of values of honesty and decency and kindness and transparency. And when I violate those, I wish I, sh I should have done something differently. And I don't, I think that's not a bad thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think that when the ought self, though, comes from the expectations of others mm. uh, unhinged to a, your own moral code, then I think so it's basically saying, well, I ought to do I should do X, Y or Z because that's what people will think highly of me because of that. Right. I should right. do X, Y or Z because that's what's expected of someone in my position. I should do X, Y or Z because then other people will think that I'm prestigious or something like that. Then mm -hmm. I think that it is. So, so I think it's really a matter of, of where the ought comes from. When the ought comes from within in your own moral code, I think that it's healthy to close that discrepancy between actual and ought. When mm -hmm. the ought comes from outside, then I think it can be perilous. Mm -hmm. so, so I guess, I guess the, the answer, uh, Jeremy, is to think of, is really to ask the question, where is this ought coming from? Is it coming from inside or outside? And I think that can be a, an interesting way to begin making sense of it. Yeah, no, I, I really like that a lot, actually. I'll definitely be keeping that in mind the next time that, uh, that I feel like I'm starting to, to should myself a little bit. Um, but yeah, we have another live question uh, from, from Brian Madmore. Uh, and he asks, is this book not selling as well as some of your other ones? Because some people might perceive the subject matter as being too negative. 
Yeah, it's a great question, Brian. And the answer is that um, sales for this book are slower than some of my other ones. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's I think that that's the reason. I mean, they're still they're still healthy. Knock. I'm not allowed to knock wood because of Omer, but they're, they're still <laughs> they're still um, they're still they're still healthy. Uh, sure. But um, yeah, you're much you know just a piece of commercial advice. You know, if you want to sell if you want to sell books, you, you're much better off reinforcing people's existing beliefs um, mm. than you are challenging people's existing beliefs. And and that's actually what I wanted to do here. That and 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 I and I appreciate that that question because that's what I'm what I'm trying to do here. We had conversations when we were putting this book together about whether we even use the word regret in the title. Um, wow. And wow. because of that negative connotation. And um, and my view was I wanted to have this, you know, what I'm trying to do here is change the conversation. And again, it's always easy. I mean, you know, we see it, especially in politics, but basically anywhere, you know, it's much easier to reinforce. The best thing to do is reinforce people's existing beliefs, but do it in a way where they think that they're clever. All right. That's like the, that's like the easiest thing to do. All right. Um, and, um, um, you know, and, and I, what I try to do in all my books is actually where, where the evidence points that way is, is sort of take on people's existing uh, beliefs um, if they're wrong. Uh, get people to think about it in a new way. This one is very ferociously held. Um, mm. um, so I'll give you I'll give you an example, Brian. So I wrote a book a hundred years ago called A Whole New Mind, and mm. and the subtitle of that book is Why Right Brainers Will Rule the Future. And there I laid out what I thought was a pretty good argument, and I think a pretty sturdy argument, that the the sorts of kind of quasi sort of metaphorically left brain skills, SAT spreadsheet kinds of skills are necessary today, but no longer sufficient because those are becoming easier to outsource and automate. Yes. Um, and that as a consequence, certain kinds of right brain skills are, um, are more gonna be more valuable because they're harder to outsource and automate. Things like artistry and empathy and big picture thinking, synthetic thinking, design, storytelling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what's the point of all this? Um, I wrote that book to try to convince the left brainers. And I might have convinced some, but it turns out that there was at least a small constituency that really wanted to hear that message of right, brain, you know, the right brainers wanted to hear that message. And so, yeah. and so in this case, I'm taking on people's existing views, but there isn't a natural consistency about people there who believe deeply in regret as a transformative emotion. Mm -hmm. So, um, so um, but, this is, but this is why we write books, right? You know, yeah. like this, this is why we write books. This is why we go out in the public sphere and, and make our case and try to make our mm -hmm. case as robustly as we possibly can, try to marshal all the evidence, try to have conversations like these with very smart people to probe. And, you know, and, and, and I think that over time, over time, um, uh, this, will, this book will do um, as well as the others, um, but it might take a little longer. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I'm also wondering, Dan, if, um, and you, you can uh, answer this question as it relates to, to this book or one of your past books. Um, but I, I'm curious, do you ever have trouble following your own advice with some of these things? Because you do offer so much great wisdom, um, really actionable stuff for us to make our lives better, whether it's uh, when it comes to regret or, or perfect timing or your or motivation. Uh, but yeah, but do you yourself ever struggle to sometimes follow some of, uh, some of this advice? I do, I do, but I, I do. I also try very much to try to eat my own dog food. Uh, in that I, in that <laughs> I never, true. you know, in that I, I very rarely prescribe anything for someone else that I wouldn't, or in many cases, haven't already done, haven't already done myself. Uh, mm -hmm. But like, you know, every human being, I'm flawed. So as, you know, as much as I believe in, as much as I believe in self compassion, um, and wh where I try to practice self compassion, I mean, there are times. I mean, this, you know. This week, when my self talk, I don't. I won't go into the whole details of it, but it's like, oh, you fucking idiot! What is wrong with you? You know, it's like that's not self compassion yeah. talk. Forgive my second time I've sworn. That's <laughs> that's uh, okay. that um, you know that's that's not following my own prescription. But at least I recognize, uh, you know, I rec I recognize that, you know. So I think recognizing your sins is the first step toward redemption. But I really do try to. Um, you know, I, I don't want to tell other people to do, I don't want to tell other people to do things that I wouldn't do, that I wouldn't do myself, truly. Right. Yeah. And maybe those like, moments of uh, lacking self-compassion, that is 
almost itself an opportunity to practice self-compassion, sure. right? You can say, sure. that's okay. And I'm not yeah. going to be perfect. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and then sometimes actually doing something, trying some of this stuff gives me the confidence that I can recommend it to others. Let me give you a specific example of that. So mm -hmm. in the book, in this new book, I, I recommend something called a failure resume, which mm -hmm. is an idea from Tina Seelig, where you, um, you know, you, you, make a list of all your screw ups, setbacks, failures, et cetera, et cetera. You know, rather than your great glorious achievements that you would put on your resume, you make a list of your failures and your blunders and all that in one mm -hmm. column. Then in the second column, you, you list what lesson you learned from it. And in the third column, you list what you're going to do about it. I recommended that in the book because I've done it and it was really <laughs> useful, you know? Right. So, so I try to be, I try to, I, I really do try to as much as possible eat my own dog food. Nice. That's, I, that's, I, I, you know what I think? I, I think that's, I think that phrase is going to be a regret. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's, that's, a, that's like a phrase that it's a, it's a phrase, it's a Silicon Valley phrase you guys have probably heard before where, you know, it's like, say you have people who, you know, develop apps or write software mm -hmm. and they, they don't use them themselves, but mm -hmm. sort of the mark of a, of a real coder is that they eat their own dog food. They use what they create. Right. No, I, I love that. I actually hadn't heard that before, but I, I enjoy it as, as a metaphor. I think that's, that's pretty funny. Um, we had um, another comment from, let me see. Oh, Izumi actually had another one. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Yeah, Izumi, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to address your second to most recent comment. Um, she says, I would love to see your book getting translated in Japanese because I think the subject matter will be more embraced there than here. And, and Dan, I know that you spent some time in Japan and you, you spent a lot of time studying their you know, Japanese media and Japanese culture. And so, um, so I am curious. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? Oh, it's coming out in Japanese. Oh, great. Yeah. I awesome. don't know exactly. I don't know exactly the timeline, but yeah, no, we have, uh, it, it'll be translated into uh, it'll be translated into, uh, it's being translated right now into Japanese. I, I assume that it's going to come out, huh? Uh, I'm guessing late in 22, perhaps early in 23. Gotcha. Okay. Well, yeah, something to look forward to. And I guess we'll, we'll see what the response is like at that time. Uh, just a couple more questions for you, Dan, before we wrap up um, in just a few minutes. Um, you know, a lot of members uh, wrote in asking about your next book. <laughs> and so, yeah, can you uh, give us any, any, any hints as to what that might be or what, what that might be about? I, I'm so totally not being cagey here. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I truly okay. don't have, I truly don't have any idea. Uh, honestly, mm -hmm. I appreciate the, the fact that there's anybody out there who would be interested in knowing the answer to that question. I really do. But um, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I have a pretty high bar for writing books in that um, I have to pick the topic that I'm really, 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 really interested in. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just too difficult. I mean, other people writing books is easier for me. It's, it's always been very, very, I've been doing it for a long time and it's still very, very hard. So mm -hmm. I only pick, I only pick books that I'm truly, I only pick topics that I'm truly interested in. And so I haven't come across anything right now that I'm so interested in. I want to devote a few years of blood, sweat and tears to yet right so right. um when i when i meet that will I'll, I'll probably um i'll probably move forward right yeah because at this point i do feel like a lot of writers um might just kind of call it a day and retire and say you know I, I wrote all these amazing books that are beloved the world over um but it seems like i you know what i'm hearing is is certainly the possibility that, that you're going to continue to write and so i guess what I'm wondering is what part of the book writing process is most rewarding for you? If, if the writing itself is so hard, you know, what, why do you do it? You know, what, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Yeah, that's to, a good question. That's a good question. Well, I mean, I'm not, so, so let me, let me, let me, let me, let me just be transparent and tell you one thing that I am thinking, and then I will answer that question, Eric. Um, sure, sure, sure. I mean, uh, just Jeremy, uh, it's, um, the, um, um, one of the things that I'm thinking about is, if I have a set of ideas, arguments, stories that I think are important, that, 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 that are important to me and that I think would contribute to the world, one of the questions I'm asking myself right now is, is a book the best vehicle for that right now? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not sure. And the fact that I'm answering, even asking that question and 
coming up with the answer, I'm not sure, is it self-telling? So that's that that is actually one of the things that I am thinking about is mm-hmm. like, you know, um, and and even I had a conversation with um with Malcolm uh maybe about a year and a half ago mm-hmm. that that made me think a little differently about this, where mm-hmm. where or or helped sort of push me over this edge where he was talking about how now he has become or trying to become um, sort of medium agnostic. And you see that in the work that he's doing, especially in audio, uh, you know, mm-hmm. medium agnostic. And, and that's, you know, and it's, you know, I'm somebody who has been a reader all of my life mm-hmm. and has been a writer most of my life. And, you know, and so that, that, so it's part of it, part of it, it there's, a, there's an identity issue there, I'm sure. And there's also just a muscle mm-hmm. memory issue there. Right, and thanks. right now, one of the things that I'm trying to do is really challenge that. And so if I have an idea, instead of immediately saying, this is a book, you know, I have to say, <laughs> I have to say, well, what is the highest and best form that this mm-hmm. idea or set of stories can take? And I don't think it's always a book. I really don't. And, and so that's, mm-hmm. that, that's, I think, the thing that I'm thinking about. Um, that's the thing that I'm thinking about the most, to, to give you an idea uh, uh, about that. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm surprised even to be saying that. I'm surprised to be thinking that, but I think it's a sign of how much the world has changed. The media landscape has changed. Right. Um, um, and, and, you know, for, for better or, you know, I don't think it's for better or for worse. I just think that, I just think that it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, if, um, you know, and I think about the experience of my son, uh, our, our son, I have a 19, we have a 19 year old and he, against his better judgment is, is majoring in journalism. Hmm. And, you know, and I think about how his, his, his view Writing is at the center of, of journalism still, but mm-hmm. even his view of like what a journalist does is not nearly as kind of print text centered as, mm-hmm. as my notion of what it is, because he's coming up in a very, very different, he's coming up in a very, very different world. Now, to your question about what part of the book writing process uh, do I like the most and I like the least? That was the question, right? Mm-hmm. Before I went off on my... Yeah. my um, uh, my introductory lecture in my media theory course. Um, the, um, the, um, uh, I like doing the research hmm. and I like interviewing people. Hmm. I like just collecting the material and mm-hmm. I sort of like making sense of it on my whiteboard. Hmm. Mm-hmm. What's difficult is taking those sort of vaporous sort of, sort of taking those pieces on the whiteboard and transforming them into sentences and paragraphs that is just that's just an inherently hard process and then doing it over and over and over again and doing it in a way that is that is that is clear and coherent and doesn't waste people's time there are moments of that that i like but on but but on many days that's really really difficult that's really yeah. really difficult and um um but I do it because, you know, I do it because that's what I do. Uh, I do it because I can't help myself. Um, mm. You know, I do it because, um, you know, I do it b- b- because it gives me the privilege of connecting with readers like we have here. It gives me the privilege of having these kinds of conversations. It gives me the privilege of having people um, respond to what I write about and have me think about things anew. Like in this conversation, I'm, I, I'm totally like, I'm so curious now about about the connection between um, uh, regret and narcissism that it's like, oh wow, okay, now, now I want to figure that out now. I want to, I want to, yeah. and so that's that. So that's what that's what keeps me in the business. Very cool. No, I, I totally relate to that. You know, I think for me anyway, one of the defining features of my personality has always been uh, curiosity, and and so reading and writing um, have always been a central way that I express that. Um, and, and so I'm very much like you, I sometimes feel like I can't help myself, you know, and yeah. that has led me to, to, to this job and, you know, to some freelance writing assignments that I've really enjoyed and yeah, it's hard, you know, but it is also kind of cool and kind of fun sometimes. So yeah, yeah, no, um, it's so very, I know it's, it, no, it's, it's very fun. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to bemoan it. I mean, you know, this, I think that, hey, you know, there's, there's a certain, there's a certain, there's a certain, um, experience I think that writers have when, um, I'll give you an example, um, sure. sort of, of sort of the mental shift that I had once when I was very young, I probably maybe 14, hmm. something like that. And, um, 
so you know most of the writing you do when you're up to 14 was um you just like write stupid things for your teacher right and mm -hmm. um and at one point um when i was a freshman in high school i got i decided to like sort of try out for the school newspaper and they gave me a assignment and i actually know what the assignment was it was an assignment about the girls softball team mm -hmm. and and it was probably a 350 word story about the girls softball sure. team and and as i was working on it i had this sort of a sort of a shift in my head where i said wait a second I'm writing about other people, like real people, like yeah. other people. And this isn't this going to enter this hermetically sealed world of my teacher and nobody else. It's going to, everyone's going to read it in the same, you know, sort of like a 14 year old, like other people are going to read it. So it's about real people and other people are going to see it. And suddenly I'm like, wow, this better be right. And it better <laughs> be good. Yeah. And you just found yourself, I found myself thinking about it in a better way. I, like I was sort of like bringing it more than I ever did. Yeah. And, and I like that feeling. Hmm. I like that feeling of wanting to bring it um, yeah. because it was something, you know, because it was something, it, because it was something meaningful. So that to me was that, that to me was a, um, you know, and then when you go a little bit further along and you're like, wait a second you get to find out stuff and then writing it up and they put your name on it and they pay yes. a little that's pretty good yeah that's, i mean when you're young it's like that's a pretty good gig i'll, I'll, I'll do that again <laughs> for sure no I, I definitely hear that and it, it makes me think of a uh, a recent another recent next big idea club selection um from paul bloom where he talks about how you know even sometimes we enjoy things partially because they're hard you know because right. they're meaningful you know right. and uh, and ultimately even if it's difficult um sometimes that's that's part of the appeal in a strange kind of way and you know i personally think about writing in that way yeah yeah you know for me it's a struggle but but there's a reason that i keep coming back and doing it and because i obviously find some kind of you know um meaning in that struggle if i don't find day-to-day -day hedonic pleasure in that struggle right yes i totally totally relate um, but, uh, but before we go too much over time here, Dan, maybe just one last question for you, yeah. uh, to bring things back to regret, um, you know, for everybody watching this, uh, live or watching this recorded later in the next big idea app, um, if you could just leave everybody with, you know, maybe one piece of advice about dealing with regret about, uh, you know, not being themselves up so much, or maybe learning from, a, from a past regret. I don't know, just, just one, one small takeaway for everybody to close things out. What would it, what would it be? Sure. It, it would be that, um, um, the fact that you have, that, that all of us have regrets, um, that if we confront them, they can make us better. And the way to confront them is to treat yourself with kindness rather than, rather than contempt to talk about them and write about them to make sense of it, and then to really draw a lesson from it. And if we do that systematically, um, we can uh, we can transform this painful emotion into a into a force for good. And I guess I mean so the other thing that I would do is reiterate something I said earlier, which is that have have a conversation about regret. That's my challenge to all of you. Have a conversation the next week about regret. And the way to do it is, as I said before. Do it with your friends, do it with your partner, do it with your team, do it with your kids, whoever. Talk about a regret that you have, tell people what you learned from it, and tell them what you're going to do about it. And I can almost guarantee you will have a very meaningful, rich, and possibly transformative conversation. I love that. I, I think that's a perfect note to end on. So everybody, as you know, the book is The Power of Regret. Uh, be sure to finish it if you haven't already. Um, <laughs> something tells me that you're going to love it from start to end. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, until next time, Daniel Pink, thank you so much. Jeremy, thanks. What a pleasure. All right. See you next time.